Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generation. So why would he fail now? He won't. Oh, he won't. Oh, he won't. Oh, he won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. Faithful in every season. So
tired this morning, not really in a mood to come to church, which is an awkward thing for a pastor to admit, but there are just days where it's difficult, and it's not because of my, my doubt or anything like that, it's just um, life can sometimes get in the way of you feeling like worshiping, and this morning has just been a beautiful morning of the Lord kind of restoring that heart in me to the point where I'm now at 10.54 a.m., 
and I can feel his presence, but it's not always just immediate. And I'm sure that you, you feel that way in your life as well. There's a beautiful part in this song that's kind of us speaking back to ourselves. And David does that in the Psalms where he kind of convinces himself that the Lord is worth offering praise. And so I invite you to do that with me this morning as we just turn to the Lord and actually convince ourselves that he is worth worshiping. Amen. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lie inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you be shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lie. said this morning's just been a lovely reminder of God's goodness and mercy toward me and just participating in community with each and every one of you is such a gift and a privilege and so I hope that you joined us even earlier for some breakfast if you're new welcome first Sunday of every month there's free food between the services so get here a little early if 10 30 is your jam or stay a little later after 8 30 but we're just so grateful that you're here with us my name is Brian I'm one of the worship pastors here I'm on staff at Branches and uh, we would just love to get to know you and to meet you. So if you haven't introduced yourself to me, I'd love to meet you. But there are some amazing people near and around you right now. Would you take a moment and just say hello to someone for a moment? We'll continue shortly. Well, good morning, Branches. Hello. 
Welcome in. Good morning. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Second service. Uh, my name is Andrew Galbraith. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm one of you. I'm, I'm someone here. That's all I am. I'm just here. I'm here. I'm present. I got to be up here today, which was a blessing to play a little bit of that. Uh, most of the time, I'm back there where Tim is today. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, working the soundboard. You guys look, and I just say this from, as a sound guy, uh, and don't take this the wrong way, but you, you look good from, from the back because I'm normally in the back. You look even better from the front. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm here to transition us, liaison us, if you will, from uh, this form of worship to another form of worship. We can worship God, and we do worship God in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the things we've been learning through this series on the graciousness and gratitude that we should have and that we know we have from, from God um, is that the way that we spend um, our, our time, uh, our money, and how we treat others is an opportunity for us to show what we what live out with what we believe, to show what we believe in all, um, to show that we are listening and, 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 and pausing and, and being with God and, and taking his lead on a lot of those things. So um, that's what we're kind of getting into today. I have, I have a challenge for you before we get into the prayer for that though. Uh, by trade, I'm, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a high school teacher. And uh, one of the cool things that I got to see uh, through this last series that we've been going through, Andrew's been challenging us uh, to make sure that reconciliation happens, rightfulness between us and others, right, around us, which is a beautiful thing. God seeks that. God wants that. You're going to get a big dose of that today from our message I love. So I have a little challenge before, a bigger challenge later, which is great. In my, at my, at my class, every Thursday, we have something that I've instituted this year called Thankful Thursdays. And we take the first two minutes of class, and I hand out note cards to my, to my ninth grade through 12th grade kids. And I say, think of someone, and I want you to do this right now too. Think of someone over this past week, maybe even today, that you are grateful for, that did something for you. It could be something simple. It could be something huge. Think of that person. Think of that thing they did. And I, my challenge to you is to thank them. We all have a supercomputer in our pockets, not all of us, but a lot of us do. We should have access to pens and papers at some kind. So my challenge to you before the sun sets today, find a way to let them know that you are grateful and thankful for them in your life, for the thing that they did, however small that is. It postures us to recognize the blessings we have in our life, the people we have in our life, the goodness that God has provided for us, even the little things. And so I, I love watching my students do it and be awkward at first. And then they, they, when I miss it on Thursdays, they'll call me on it. Or if I'm absent, they'll be like, hey, it's Friday. We didn't do it yesterday. This is something. I'm like, all right, we'll do it today. So just an encouragement for you. We are going to enter a time of giving, which is a way that we, we also worship uh, our Lord and Savior. It's a way that we, we say, God, this is yours. Uh, it was yours to begin with. It was never mine, and I trust you. If you are a visitor here, first time, welcome in. You are an honored guest. We hope that you had food. Uh, this, not, not, not necessarily for you, unless you feel called to do so. But if you are someone that considers this a home, um, God as your Lord and Savior, this is sort of one of those ways that, that we, out of free will, get to show him we love him, we care for him, we appreciate him, and that we are grateful for his sacrifice for us. Um, the baskets will be passed. You can give online as well. Um, and if you are someone that maybe just needs to pray over the basket as it passed, do that. But I'm gonna pray for us now, kind of transition us into that. Uh, so if you bow your heads with me, Lord, we thank you so much for the breath in our lungs today, God. We thank you for the food that we were provided with. We thank you for the crew that's, that showed up early to, to make that food for us, to, to have that sacrifice because they believe in this community that you've helped us set up, Lord. Um, we ask that you receive these offerings that we give right now as worship, God, as our way of, of, of showing that we trust you, we honor you, um, and we will trust you to take these and do with them your will, God. Your will first, let ours fall. Show us, lead us in that. Show us today through the message what you want us to do and become as uh, just following after you and your son. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to be here today. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please uh, take your attention to the screens. We have some announcements for you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Shea, pastor of Teaching and Vision here at Branches. I've got a couple important announcements for you. First of all, do me a favor. Please put this on your calendars. Show up to this event. We're having our first annual citywide worship event. That's calling all Christians in the city from all the various congregations. Serve City's hosting this. You guys know that's the organization we help facilitate that is bringing the churches together. This first annual citywide worship event is going to be so important for us. It's an annual thing we're going to be hosting. We want it to be the largest gathering of any type in Huntington Beach on an annual basis. And that's not something that's not feasible. We've got so many Christians in this city. If we could pull everyone together for one event, one time a year for just two hours to worship the Lord, it's going to be a time that's going to just expand our visions for what God wants to do in this city. So we're going to have multiple worship leaders from various churches. No one church's name is going to be on it. There's not going to be any personalities or pastors that are going to be highlighted. We're highlighting the name of Jesus and lifting him up in this city. Now, it's going to take place behind the library uh, in Central Park here. That's where we host our park services. There's a bandstand. If you want to park in the parking lot, walk down the hill. You'll see behind the library, there's that outdoor space. We're going to start at 5 o'clock. Uh, it's on May 10th, by the way, Friday, May 10th. That's this coming week. Uh, we're going to start at 5, have some food so you can come hungry. We're going to have some bounce houses for the kids, and then we're going to have that time of worship together. Uh, guys, we want this to be accessible for everyone from a two-year-old to somebody who's 90. Whether you're single, you've got a family, we want every Christian in the city of Huntington Beach to start developing this discipline of once a year coming together to lift up only one name, and that is the name of Jesus. So please do me a favor, put it in your calendars, make sure you're there for this first one. We don't know, is it going to be 50? Is it going to be 200 this year? Uh, it's just the first year. But we want to see 10, 20, 30 years from now, we're all committing. If we're associated with a church in Huntington Beach, if we live in Huntington Beach, uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we want to see this be 5,000, 10,000 Christians coming together on an annual basis. So please be a part of this first one, Friday, May 10. All right, we also need some families volunteers. You've heard me talking about this, calling for family volunteers on the way to Easter. We knew that there'd be a big attendance and I know that like over 40 of you signed up to volunteer for the first time and help supplement those services. We had more than enough volunteers to care for all the kids that showed up, all the new families. It was incredible. Uh, but I've got another request because only one person from that over 40 that signed up for Easter Sunday signed up to continue serving with our family ministry. And, and I got to say, we need help. <laughs> we just do. Uh, and I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but... This is a great thing that's happening in our church community. We are setting records every single weekend for kids' ministry attendance. I believe last week it was over 160 kids. The week before that was 177 kids. We're not even talking youth. That is an unbelievable amount of kids. And that's going to need more help. That's going to need more people stepping up to serve, especially in the summer months when people are going to be taking breaks here and there for vacations. So if you could just sign up to serve over the summer, uh, that means serving once a month, twice a month over the summer months. That's going to help us supplement uh, the current resources that we have in terms of volunteers. And guys, understand, this is doing the work of Jesus, discipling and raising up the next generation. 177 kids is like double the size of the average church in America. That's what we've got in our children's ministry. And there are churches that are praying and hoping that they would even have one family with one kid or two kids in their congregation. Here we have 177. So let's not look at this as a problem. Let's look at this as an opportunity for us to serve and get involved. If you're new, it's a great way to meet families, to do the work of Jesus, and to start helping and giving back to this community that you're receiving from. If you want to sign up, Talk to our kids' ministry volunteers in their section at the opening of the Senior Center or go to the connection table and fill out a connection card. We'd love for you to jump in. Again, we need about 15 more of service. So if you're thinking maybe it's me, it's you. It's you. You're the one. Uh, and, and if you're not thinking it, start thinking it because it's you. You're the one. We need you. And by the way, we have an informational meeting for Foster the City. That's an organization that we partner with uh, that is working with churches across Orange County and really across California to help families in the church address this great need of serving these foster children that are in the system. Uh, they can help you get connected with actually fostering a child, or they can get you uh, resourcing a family in the church that's going to be fostering 
a child. It needs the whole community to come around these families to support them and uplift them as they take on this important responsibility. So if you want to find out more about fostering, if you want to find out more about getting involved in helping families that are fostering in our own community, it's a great service opportunity. There's an informational meeting at the Garden Church. It's on May 19th at 2 p.m. Child care is provided. There's going to be some light refreshments. Uh, you're going to meet people from other churches that are also concerned about the same issue. This is going to take the whole body of Christ to address this need that's so close to God's heart. Now, to share more on that, I'm sure, in the midst of his sermon and to just share with us this morning in, in the form of a sermon, we've got Ryan McDonald here. He's a leader in Foster the City. Uh, let me tell you, as he brings this topic of generosity on compassion, uh, he is someone who lives it. He and his wife, they've fostered themselves, they've adopted, uh, as well as they've got some uh, natural children of their own. They've got a lot on their plates. He's a pastor, he's a teacher and preacher. He's just an incredible man of God. He's going to be closing out this series. Would you please give him a warm branches welcome right now? Good. Yeah, well, it's just an honor to be here, uh, like Andrew said in his very flattering introduction. My name is Ryan, and I have the joy of leading Foster the City in Orange and L.A. County, and we resource churches to start and sustain foster care ministries to help the church engage in this crisis in our own backyard. There's lots of ways for people to get involved. Fostering is just kind of in the deep end of the pool, so to speak, but there's a lot in between that in terms of being a support friend to wrap around and support the families that are fostering, to be one of the advocates, to lead the ministry at this church, and a bunch of stuff in between. And so if you don't know about the Garden Church, it's an amazing church. They used to be in Long Beach. Now they're here in our city. And so I would just ask you 2 p.m., two Sundays from now, Come out to the meeting. Just learn how you can support, how you can get engaged. I promise we will not send you home with a child. I think. I mean, I promise. I mean, if you're willing, then let's set something up. But we won't do that, okay? And I just first want to author, uh, honor Catherine Carcutt, who leads this ministry here. So can you give her a big, warm round of applause? If it wasn't for her, there wouldn't be a Foster the City ministry here at Branches. And so there is a role for everyone. I'm going to be at the back table after service. Please come and say hi. Sometimes when no one comes to talk to me, I get sad and I get lonely. And the body of the Christ, you guys just learned about fellowship. So let's have some fellowship together. And I promise I won't guilt you, guilt trip you into doing anything you don't want to do. All right? Okay. Well, we are continuing on in our... Um, our generous series, talking about generous compassion. I have a little introduction here from Andrew he wanted me to read. It just says, the great and ruddingly handsome and surprisingly chill theologian and pastor Andrew Shea <laughs> says that, ruddingly handsome? Who? Anyway, um, says that this series is about the generosity of God towards us being embodied in how we live and treat Others. The working thesis of this mini series that we're in is that in light of the gospel given through the person of Jesus, we ought to be the most generous people on the planet. And over the last four weeks, we've learned how God actually inspires and He motivates generosity in our fellowship with one another, generosity in how we use our time generosity in how we use our words, and last week, generosity in our forgiveness. And this morning, we'll see how Jesus' lavish compassion calls us to be compassionate to those in need, that God's generous compassion for you should be the shape and the form of how you show compassion to others. And Andrew definitely did not tell me to introduce him as ruddingly handsome and surprisingly chill, although I think he is both of those things personally. Okay, right out of the gate, when we start talking about compassion, we got a big problem to address. I mean, this is a beast of an issue. And in part, it's a problem because it's invisible. You can't really see it because it's like a fish in water. It's the environment that we are so accustomed to that we actually grow cold and realize it's a part of our life. And that is the fact that we live in a compassionless world. 
that each and every day when you interact with people, you are not bumping into generous compassion. You are bumping into people who are isolated and distracted and mostly focused on their own life and their own family. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples from my own life by looking at my little neighborhood in the beautiful suburban middle class context of Brea, California. Anyone visited Brea, California? Thank you for coming to my fine city, which has nothing remarkable about it. And in my neighborhood, which is just a typical neighborhood in America, I'm just going to walk you through my neighbors and some of the experiences that I've had. The neighbor that I share a wall with, his name's Dave. He's a great guy. I've only talked to him a few times. One of those times is because I was doing dishes in my backyard and I looked out the window and he has a nice swimming pool. I wish I had a swimming pool, but I don't. I have a giant tree that provides shade. He has a nice swimming pool. I like the shade. He likes the pool. These things do not work well together. I'm doing dishes and I just see a pool net come over my backyard, turn over and dump all of the leaves from the pool into my backyard. And so I was like, that was interesting. Maybe it was just a fluke. Keep washing dishes. Nope. Another net full of leaves. Dump. Right in my backyard. This happens repeatedly until I'm like, I should go talk to the guy. So I go out there and I'm like, hey, Dave, what you doing? He goes, uh, cleaning out my pool. I was like, I can see that. I was like, "Um, just wondering if you had a waste bin to put these leaves in because I have two. I did. I, I don't know how, but I have two waste bin, land waste bins. I'm thinking maybe his ended up in my backyard and I got to get it back to him ASAP. And he's like, no, 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 I have my own waste bin. And I was like, well, do you think maybe we could put the leaves somewhere else other than my backyard, Dave? And he goes, well, they came from your tree, so I'm just returning them. <laughs> Which is a solid argument, to be honest with him. I mean, I didn't have much to say. But I went to talk to him and realized that him and my lanyard are in this like decade-long feud. They hate each other. They call the city on each other all the time. They try to get back to each other. And I, as this humble renter, is just caught up in the middle of this tension that they've experienced for years. A few uh, doors down are one house on the right and one house on the left, and they've only ever come to talk to me to spread neighborhood gossip about other people. Next to them is this nice lady who was walking her dog, and the only comment she's ever made to me in front of my children was, hey, be careful in your house. I said, oh, okay. I'm interested. <laughs> Tell me why. She's like, 10 years ago, someone broke into it. I said, huh, all right. Thanks for the unnecessary fear in front of my children. <laughs> and then the other day, um, the neighbor, this, was my, this is Wednesday night, the neighbor right behind me, their car actually caught on fire in the middle of the street, and then uh, it was preceded by two massive explosions, I presume, the engine and the gas tank, but the flames were shooting like 20 feet in the air. It was a pretty scary event, and as neighborhoods do, everyone kind of came out and piled out, and they're watching, and I was actually somewhere else. My wife called me, so I'm rushing home. She's like, the kids are scared. Get home, you know, so I went into like super dad mode. You guys ever go into super dad mode? Driving like 95 in Brea, praying I don't get pulled over. And we get there, and we're out on the corner. I mean, there's literally dozens of people watching this car burn up. And I'm just kind of tuned into people's conversations. And there's no talk of concern for the family. There's no talk about, man, I wonder if they need another vehicle. There is talk about how this family had it coming because they don't take care of their stuff. And we live in this type of isolated, distracted social state, don't we? In general, people are not coming to the table to listen to each other's perspectives, to understand where they're coming from. They're certainly not disadvantaging themselves, cutting across their own comfort and luxuries to go out of the way to help people who are in need. You and I live in a compassionless world. And that's a problem. Because we're followers of Jesus, or we're here checking out Jesus to see what he's like. And one of the things he's like is calling us to be people of compassion, who move towards, not away from those who are hurting, who pitch in to get a new car when their neighbor's car explodes, not gossip about how they had this coming because they don't take care of their stuff. And yet that is not our experience. We don't exactly live in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, do we? And I'm sure you have your own stories of neighborhood dysfunction and drama that I would love to hear, honestly. If we could just open mic this and go through your neighborhoods, that'd be a lot of fun. 
But the point is, our culture is forming us to move away from people that are hurting. And we live in an environment that is not inviting compassion, it's actually quenching it. And so we have this problem. How do we, as followers of Jesus, become people of compassion in a compassionless world? In order to answer this question, we must turn to Jesus. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Luke. It's one of the Gospels, uh, the third one in the New Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 10. And you can hop on over to verse 25. That's where our story starts this morning. If you need a Bible, I found this out the hard way during the first service when I forgot to say something. Bibles are being passed out, and they are free of charge. I imagine if you don't have a Bible, you can take it home and keep it as a gift from Branches Church. All right, let's read Luke 10, starting in verse 25 together. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? The expert in the law answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the expert in the law wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a, a Levite, he came to the place and he saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity or compassion on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. I thank you for these amazing men and women who have gathered in the name of Jesus. I thank you that most are here because you have been so good to them that they are compelled to press into you. God, I also acknowledge that as I read a story like this, some may feel like the half-dead man on the side of the road. That they are just through with it. They're beat up. They're emotionally tired. They're spiritually dry. They're physically exhausted. And they need someone to see them and move towards them. 
God, I pray that they would be filled with your spirit today and you would minister power and grace and life and healing in Jesus' name. God, I also acknowledge that some of us have gotten in a pattern of neglecting the hurting and the poor and those right around us who need help. And God, I pray that you would kindly and graciously and only the way a father could restore us back to practicing compassion. Lord, we are here because of you and for you and to you. Jesus, we love you. We love your name. We love your grace. And we pray that you would be honored by our time meeting together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's much to pull out of this very rich passage, but in line in our theme of generous compassion, I simply want to point out three things. The first one is that practicing generous compassion requires repentance. If you are going to get in the game of compassion, so to speak, it requires repentance. Jesus is walking along the road. He's with his disciples. He's teaching. He's hanging out. And almost out of nowhere, he's kind of ambushed by this expert in the Mosaic law. I mean, this is the guy who knew everything about the Jewish Bible. If you were in youth group and you had Bible trivia, you want this guy on your team because it means you're getting extra pizza after it's over, okay? This is supposed to be a positive figure. As he approaches Jesus, the original audience is not thinking, boo. They're thinking, oh, okay, someone important is talking to Jesus. And Luke tells us that he's not coming to learn from Jesus. He's coming to test him. He's actually coming to school Jesus. His motives are revealed to us, the reader, which is a great help. And so he's coming to expose the fact that Jesus didn't go to any rabbinical schools. He breaks the Sabbath all the time. This guy's a jokester. He's playing around with the religious law. And so he pulls out of his back pocket one of the most hotly debated rabbinical topics of the day. How do you inherit eternal life? a topic that theologians are still debating to this day within our Christian community. But Jesus' brilliance here, he turns the question right back on him. He says, well, what do you say? How do you read the law? Jesus knew this was the type of guy who liked to share his own opinions and hear himself talk. And so he like musters up, puffs out his chest and spits out the correct answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And one of the great surprises of this text is Jesus does not correct the man and adds nothing to his answer. He simply says, do this and you will live. In fact, Jesus gave the same answer in various places throughout the gospel, teaching us that true, abundant, rich, meaningful, eternal life is found in loving the God who first loved you and loving your neighbor to the same degree you love yourself. That's it. That is the sum of everything we are about as followers of Jesus. Jesus affirms the man's response, and he sends him on his way. And at this point, the expert's plan has not only failed, it has backfired, because he came to expose Jesus, but now he stands exposed. With six words, do this and you will live, The expert in the law can no longer hide between mere discussion and theological insight. He is now forced to go and practice the things he knows to be true about the kingdom. And the expert feeling the conviction of God and scared that he's going to be found out as a fraud scrambles. And Luke in verse 29 tells us, desiring to justify himself he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Almost in desperation, you can hear him kind of blurt it out, can't you? Well, well, who's my neighbor anyway, huh? Who's to say who my neighbor is? He asked this question because the common rabbinical teaching of the day excluded people outside of Israel from being neighbor. And some rabbis even taught you only had to love the people in your immediate community. I mean, Jesus points this out directly in Matthew 5 verses 43 when he says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's quoting the common rabbinical thought 
of the day. And this is a teaching that at its core excused God's people from loving anyone they disliked. In asking who is my neighbor, the expert in the law is trying to justify himself by minimizing the scope of people God requires him to love. Or in the words of the message translation, he is looking for a loophole, a way around not having to practice true, generous compassion. About 10 years ago, I started studying Christian community development. And it's the philosophy of helping and serving the poor uh, developed by um, John Perkins, one of the great civil rights uh, leaders of our time. And it's this idea that in helping the poor, we shouldn't hand them things, give them a handout. We should actually give them a hand up. We should do creative, community-focused solutions to build people up within the community that they can find their own solutions and they can become self-sustaining. And I read books like When Helping Hurts. Anyone read that book? Yep. And um, Restoring At-Risk Communities and Toxic Charity. And so I started reading and reading and reading and reading, and I had been enlightened. I had found the answer. Everyone else was doing it wrong, and I had the truth. I was righteous in my philosophy and my approach to help the poor. And I remember this poor volunteer at our church who worked in our food distribution. And oh man, I had some thoughts about food distribution from all my, you know, four books that I read. And so she's talking to me about it, and I said, you know, food distribution isn't the best way to go. She said, oh, okay, you know, like I'm having fun, and I, I like my friends, and it's nice to do something kind. I'm like, no, 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 you're making the problem worse. <laughs> food co-ops, that's what you should be doing. You should turn this into a food co-op, a program where people who need food buy in and they work the counter and you set up a store and you teach urban farming and then they come and they bring their produce and they buy into the co-op $30 a month and so they're invested and so it's not a handout, it's a hand up. If you did that, then you'd be really helping people. Okay, cool, thanks, see you next week. <laughs> How do you think she felt after talking to me? Condemned. How else? crushed, discouraged, doesn't, actually, doesn't really sound like Jesus, does it? But what if you were there, we could go back 11, 10 years, and you go, hey, Ryan, uh, excuse me, I have a question. Um, how many food co-ops have you started? <laughs> well, none. Okay, it's, it's fine, it's fine. Um, how many food co-ops have you served at? Well, I, I don't know of any, so I, I haven't served at any. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I get it. Have you ever been to a food co-op? Well, no. Have you ever talked to an actual person who worked at a food co-op? Well, no, but I read this book. <laughs> and on and on it goes. And I identify with the expert in the Mosaic Law because I, too, hide behind the things that I know about God so I don't actually have to obey him. And this in lies one of the greatest temptations of religion, of having a body of, using that positively, having a body of teaching, an ethical body of teaching that orients your life as a philosophy, is we think that just knowing the right thing to do is what God requires of us. And over and over and over and over, God said, it is not about what you do. It is about what you do, not just the ideas that you ascribe to. God wants us to be actual people of justice. And it's so easy for our hearts just to hide behind the philosophies and the things we know to be true. If you and I are going to grow in our practice of being people of compassion, we have to practice repentance. That's what I'm doing by sharing this story. I'm repenting. I am publicly announcing that this was a wrong way to go about life within the community, and I want to change how I interact with my brothers and sisters in Christ because this will not get us to where we need to go as a family. And repentance is not just a form of self-pity. You guys seen Winnie the Pooh? Do you know who this guy is? Eeyore. Eeyore. Thank you, Eeyore. Was it my acting? I thought so. 
What's, Eeyore, what's Eeyore's form of repentance? Oh, man, I blew it again. This sanctification thing is real hard. Keep trying to follow Jesus, but I'm tripped up. Guess I'll never be perfect like Pastor Andrew or Pastor Brian. <laughs> repentance is not self-pity. It's also not a weakness that's confessed that precludes you from God's grace as if he didn't already know that you were jacked up. Repentance is a form of healing. It is how God gets deep into the recesses of our heart and he rewires things. It opens the door for heart transformation. Repentance is the way of the kingdom. Jesus' entire announcement was what? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is here. It's now. You can access it. You can taste it. You can live in it. You can act like God. And the door to get into that type of life and that joy and that peace is repentance. And so you and I, if we are going to take this compassion life with Jesus thing seriously, we need to be repenting when God shows us pride. And when we're convicted about our lack of love for the hurting or the poor, we don't just quickly pull out our theology card, like I'm so tempted to do, our philosophy card. We tell God about that missions trip we did three years ago. No, we stop and we say, God, what are you doing right now? Why are you convicting me right now? What do you want to do in my life right now to help me move towards those who are hurting? And so we pray things like, Lord, I know you've commanded me to love the poor but I find myself too busy and distracted to help those suffering around me. Forgive me today and teach me to love others the way that you love him. Lord, I, I don't want to use my knowledge of Jesus to cover over my indifference for those hurting. Please take this habit from me. Give me a new heart, soft and ready to act in the same way that you acted towards me. And when we repent, God forgives us. You learned about that last week. Fully, completely, and totally forgives us. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 assures us he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we fail to love our neighbors in need, God stands ready and willing to offer his forgiveness. So generous compassion requires repentance. The second thing from this text is that practicing generous compassion requires proximity. How you guys doing? You doing good? It's not fun when a guest preacher shows up and tells you all to repent, is it? I'm sorry for that. I'm just trying to teach the text, and I am 100% in this thing with you. And there will be some real beautiful glimmers of the gospel, so stick with me. The next thing is that we practice proximity. We draw near to those who are hurting. Jesus sees right through the Bible experts' attempts to justify his indifference. And he answers his question, who is my neighbor, with a parable. The parable is of a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a, a rough, rugged, mountainous pass, 17 miles with caves and boulders. It was notorious for people hiding and jumping out and ambushing people, beating them up and stealing things. So the hearers would have been well familiar with this road. And Jesus tells of an all too common Jewish traveler who's attacked, robbed, stripped, and left for dead. He's in critical condition. If nobody stops to help this man, he will die. There is no 911. There is no helicopter, I'm lost in the wilderness, people looking for him. He's dying on the side of the road, and if no one helps him, he will die. And Jesus gives us two significant glimmers of hope in the story, doesn't he? Did you feel them? First of all, it was who? A priest. That was good news. This is a fellow brother in the faith. Priests were appointed by God literally to care for God's people. And the second glimmer of hope was a Levite. This guy was employed full-time to work at the temple. It was his job to prepare a space where people could meet with Yahweh and Yahweh could meet with his people. If anyone in all of Israel was primed and ready to serve this man, it would have been them. And yet both of them see him in his suffering and pass by on the other side. And we don't know why. It's possible they didn't want to defile themselves. 
If they would have touched the blood or if the man would have died, they would have been out of work for seven days doing the purification rituals. It's possible that they were too busy, that they had all of their affairs at the church and the temple. In the words of Nacho Libre, they had a lot of priestly duties to do. That's a great movie. This guy had a lot of priestly duties. He's too busy to help this man in need. And it's possible that they were just scared, right? You see a guy beat up in a dark alley? What are you thinking? I got to get out of here, you know? So we don't know, but we do know that someone did stop to help, don't we? In stark contrast to the religious leaders who saw and passed by on the other side, searing and condemning words there. Jesus tells us that the Samaritan saw, had compassion, and went to him. You see the difference? Three responses. All three men saw the person in need. The only difference in their response was proximity. While the religious leaders went that way, the Samaritan went towards the man. And they would have been deeply offended by this story. I mean, Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans were once Israelites who refused to return after exile. They married other nations, and they discredited well over half of the Jewish scriptures as nonsense. They were seen as deserters. They had turned their back on God and his people. And Jesus' parable of a righteous, law-abiding outsider, while the priest and the Levi were breaking the Mosaic law by not helping, would have been egregious to them. Tim Keller says it this way in his book, Generous Justice. By depicting a Samaritan helping a Jew, Jesus could not have found a more forceful way to say that anyone at all in need, regardless of race, politics, class, and religion, is your neighbor. The Samaritan drew near, the leaders turned away. You know, in my own journey of trying to become a person of compassion, I have found that proximity has been the most formational aspect of my steps to becoming a foster parent. I remember when my wife first asked me if I could tell you just a few stories to become and to consider foster care. I was apprehensive. I knew people should be doing that, but I didn't want to do it. It just sounded so hard to welcome this traumatized kids with all these behaviors in my home just to like have them beat me up emotionally for a few months and then for them to go back to live with their mom. I was like, no thanks. But my wife was a case manager for youth aging out of the foster care system. And one of her former clients was 24 and he needed a place to live. He was homeless. So he got connected to this organization called Safe Families and we were able to host him for a while. And I got to know him, and it was weird at first. I mean, my wife and I had been married for two years. We never had anyone live with us. We got this, like, 24-year-old kid. He's terrible hygiene, terrible social skills, doesn't know how to take care of himself. I'm just like, what do I do? This is so weird. But I began to develop just a real soft heart towards him over the time I got to know him and hear his story. When he was 14 years old, the reason he's in foster care is because there was a horrific event that led to significant physical disability and killed his entire family. He was the only one who survived this event. And the thing that breaks my heart about it is when he entered into foster care, social workers never found a family for this little boy to live with. At 14 years old, having swallowed the worst pill you can imagine, there was no one who opened their home to this little boy. And that just ripped at my heart. I remember one day we were driving on this street called Bastion Cherry in Fullerton. I'll never forget it. We're almost to the top of this hill that kind of overlooks the area. And I was trying to connect with them. I was struggling to connect with them. He just played video games all day. (laughs) I don't play video games at all. And I was just like, tell me about the video games you play. You play these fantasy games. Like, what are they like, you know? And I was expecting a lighthearted conversation. He just turned to me and he said, you know what? I've experienced so much pain in this world. Playing fantasy video games takes me to a place where nobody can hurt me. I just, those words are just seared on my heart. And it was that moment that my hesitations about being a foster dad began to melt away. And what I saw was a 14-year-old kid who did not choose this life. He was given this life. And at his 
deepest moment of need. No one was there to help him, and that story stuck with me, and God used it. Proximity, closeness, intimacy, hearing his story, getting to know him has changed my heart in a significant way. Over the last seven years, we've had, I think, 12 or 13 children that we've been able to care for. And it has been hard, it has been stretching, it has been challenging, but it has been one of the greatest joys of my life to be the caregiver for a child who needs someone to love them. And some of those babies were experiencing withdrawal symptoms from exposure to drugs in utero. And those are some really hard times. Three in the morning having rocked this baby for over two hours who's inconsolable because their body feels like it's on fire. And there is something about the cry of a baby that's withdrawing that you will never forget. And yet those are some of my sacred moments of prayer. Sorry. Where I was in the secret place with the Father I'm so tired. I'm just so, I just want to sleep so bad. Parents, I see you out there. Two in the morning, you just want to sleep. You have work. Lord bless you. And I'm, I just, I have no solutions. There's nothing in my body or my spirit that can meet this kid's needs. And so I'm just holding them. And I'm asking God to fill this child with his spirit so they can get some sleep. There's something about entering into someone's pain that draws you close to Jesus that I cannot explain. I cannot teach on it. I cannot unpack it. I have no proof text verse. I've experienced it. That when you practice proximity with people who are suffering in faith, God meets you, and he begins to change you. And I just think who I was in my 20s. I was so selfish. I really was. I didn't really care about people. I didn't have deep, meaningful relationships. I was floundering in my relationship with God. I was going through the motions of church. I would do sound, and I would show up hungover, and I would literally run slides and do sound hungover because I just, I wasn't finding life in my faith. And then I started moving towards the poor, and I started practicing proximity. It's like the kingdom of God opened up for me. And some of the callous parts of my heart started to change, and I'm not alone in this. We have 2,000 years of God's people moving towards the poor and God meeting them and pouring out his presence and not only transforming them in the process, but using them in powerful ways to serve people who are in desperate need to encounter the love of God. So this morning, who is it for you? Who is God calling you to draw near to in the way that God drew near to him. It's going to take courage. It's going to take repentance. But I promise you that God will meet you when you move towards those who are hurting. The usher is going to hand out tissues now for anyone who needs one. (laughs) And the last thing, and this will be much shorter, is that practicing generous compassion requires Offering your resources to God. Stuff that God's given you, your mind, your intellect, your personality, the money in your bank account, the home that you rent or own, the type of conversation that you like to have, the smile on your face, the warmth of your hug, everything about you. Offering it as a resource to God. Instead of passing by on the other side, the Samaritan drew near to the half-dead man. And this act of drawing near, this act of proximity created compassion. And that compassion compelled him to offer his resources. First, he poured out his own oil and wine to clean and heal the man's injuries. Then he sat the man on his own donkey and transported him to safety. Then he put him up in a hotel and he stayed the night with him to ensure his recovery and safety. Then he opened up a tab 
covering any and all expenses that would occur during his stay at the inn. Then he enlisted the innkeeper's aid, saying, pay careful attention to this man here to ensure his recovery. And lastly, he promised to return, to see him fully restored to health. Any one of these would have been a radical act of kindness. But the Good Samaritan just pours out literally all that he has to see this man made whole. He spared no expense to see his own enemy restored to full health. So what do we do with a story like that? Anyone else intimidated by that example of justice? I mean, I prefer the Honda commercials, Random Act of Kindness. You guys seen those? Those are my speed, okay? Like, if this was a Random Act of Kindness Honda commercial in Luke 10, that's extremely anachronistic. But anyway, I would be like, okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. But then I look at this story and what this guy did, I'm like, man, that is a crushing example to try to live up to if we are to become people of compassion. So what do we do with this story? Well, I suggest two things, two ways that we process this story. And the first one is that we let it motivate us to action. You do not need to be like this man in your compassion. Where you are right now is perfect. If God wanted you to be somewhere else in your compassion journey, guess what? You'd be there already. But you have the amount of compassion you have right now already by grace and anything else you get by grace. And so you don't have to feel shame or guilt for who you are not because God loves you right where you are and everything you have is already a gift from God anyway. But at the same time, we cannot ignore Jesus' command at the end. What does he say? He summarizes this whole thing by saying what? Go and what? Do likewise. This is an example for us to strive towards. This is the stuff of the kingdom of God that every believer is invited to participate in. Now, it is not possible to become this guy overnight. It's just not. Don't even try, okay? Soul crushing to try to compare yourself to our Samaritan buddy who just poured it all out for this man and the Lord. But you could take small steps today to become a person of compassion that 10, 20, 30 years from now, your life could look a lot like this. And I fully believe that this is possible. I have met people who live like this. There are biographies written about people who actually live like this. Life in the kingdom like this is possible, but it is the small step of obedience each and every day to get there. Keep a hygiene kit in your car to give to someone who is houseless. Donate money to organizations like Foster the City. No, really. Donate money to Foster the City to help us find more homes for kids in care. Come to the interest meeting in two weeks at the garden, 2 p.m., and learn how you can get involved. Start to cultivate a heart for justice and compassion. Each morning when you pray up this month, pray a simple, quick prayer. God, would you soften my heart towards people who are hurting? Read a book on immigration, refugees, foster care, the housing crisis. Become a support friend with Foster the Family. Invite somebody who is lonely to come to your table and share a meal. There are a hundred different things you could do today to become this type of person. And God is welcoming you into this type of life. And there is joy and there is peace because that's where Jesus is. And the second thing that we do with this story is we let it point us to Jesus. Because ultimately, these examples, they're too high for us to live out on some ways. But there is one good Samaritan who fully and completely loved like this. And his name is Jesus. He not only poured out wine and oil, he poured out his own blood on the cross so that when you were enemies of God, Romans 5 tells us, you could be reconciled back to the Father. He gave of his own resources. He entered human form through the incarnation and he was born into a poor, impoverished family to dignify those who have the experience of poverty. 
And he not only heals our physical wounds, but he heals our souls and makes us whole. He not only paid the debt to the innkeeper, he paid the debt of sin that you and I owe. He not only brought us to the innkeeper, he brought us to our Father in heaven who abundantly loves us and provides for us. And he promised to return by sealing us with the Holy Spirit to say, one day I will make you whole. And every moment of pain and every moment of disappointment and every setback that you have ever experienced, I will work backwards and I will heal it for all of eternity. That is the Jesus that we serve. But he's not only the ultimate good Samaritan, he's ultimately the ultimate Jewish traveler. Because though this man was robbed and beaten and stripped in private, Jesus was publicly robbed and stripped and beaten on our behalf. And this person was betrayed by these strangers who took advantage of him, but Jesus was betrayed by his own people who he came to save. Church, Jesus is ultimately the good Samaritan that this story is about. And the more that we look to Jesus the more we delight in the story of the gospel, the more our hearts will be transformed to love and serve people the way that Jesus has loved us. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. God, I thank you that when I was half dead on the side of the road, unable to make anything of my life, you saw me and you moved towards me and you had compassion on me. God, I thank you that it is a joy to partner with you to bring the kingdom of God. That there is peace, rich, meaningful peace in the midst of chaos. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters gathered here this morning. I pray for anyone who's feeling beat down, who's feeling robbed of something. Maybe it was an experience or a relationship. They're feeling stripped. They're feeling vulnerable in front of you. They're feeling unable to pull themselves out of the situation that they find themselves in. They sound like the perfect candidate for grace. In spirit, I pray that you would fill them and you would drive them to yourself. God, I pray for those of us who are freshly inspired to practice generous compassion. Thank you that you love us just the way that you are, that we are not your project. You're not disappointed with us and so you're enacting discipline to get us somewhere where we're not yet. You love us. You are a father and we are your kids. And you're saying, come along with me. Come along with me and practice compassion. I am a compassionate God. I want to be with my kids. I want to work with them in the workshop of compassion. I want to teach them my trade with joy as we sit side by side and we delight in God as we delight in loving others. Father, you love us. You have lavished your love upon us. There's nothing that we could do to earn your love. There's nothing that we could do to make ourselves more worthy of your favor. Jesus, Jesus is our justification. And so, God, would we more and more learn to delight in the gospel, the good news that God loves us just the way that we are. And it is his joy to heal and restore us and invite us to practice his kingdom work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a prayer team available in the four corners. If you would like prayer, if you, if you need to repent of indifference, go to one of these people and repent and find life. If you are beat down by life and you need Jesus, go receive prayer today.
never like to be a church that rushes through things, but also acknowledging that we're going a little longer this morning. If you have a kid that you'd like to go dismiss out of kids ministry and even join us back here, feel free to do that. But we're just going to continue to worship for maybe another five minutes and leave room for prayer. the poor 